everyone. Welcome back to the Redmond and Riddle podcast. We're excited to be with you today. We have a Q&A special. This is officially the eighth episode. and We've had six normal episodes and this is our second Q&A special. This is the last one for a little while. So we're going we're gonna to make the most of it. We're going to mm. be hearing from you guys and try and respond wisely yes. to your questions. I'm not sure if we will or not, but we'll do our best. <laughs> and we were just talking a moment ago about broadcasting or yeah. recording things. and Because ultimately that isn't our first skill or calling maybe i no, don't know but I, I don't want to speak for you you may feel it <laughs> you may feel it is <laughs> oh no 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 not not me i was just commenting on what a brilliant voice you have well so for we these were, kinds of things we were talking about that because I, everyone always tells me i'm very monotone so i have to make a special effort sometimes <laughs> so the classic one was uh, years back i had this thing come through from veggie tales and they said would you would you like to be part of this VeggieTales Matt. project? We're going to be doing Blessed Be Your Name and Better Is One Day. It's legendary. And, we, and we'd love you to come and sing them and also speak to the vegetables. So, <laughs> so you know, people are thinking, like, oh, you can do that. But I'm like, I've got young kids. I'm definitely Absolutely. doing that. I'm 100% Absolutely. in. Absolutely. But the embarrassing thing was I went in, I recorded my stuff, and then they had to call me back in because <laughs> once Bob and Larry and all the other vegetables recorded their parts, they said I sounded like I was somewhere between disinterested and, and depressed. <laughs> My tone was so like monotone. It'd be like, you know, Bob and Larry would be like, hi, Matt. Yes. And I'd be like, oh, you're God. just. <laughs> <laughs> so it was embarrassing. Wow, I got no. called back in. I had to re-record everything. Well, let's just say you nailed that because <laughs> do you know how I introduce you to my kids? Is I go, hey guys, do you remember that VeggieTales episode <laughs> where the voice, do you guys remember that voice? I'm like, that's Matt Redman. And they're like, oh, they could care less about all the songs, but the fact that you were on VeggieTales. Yeah, it was a good, it was, was a, it was a good moment. It goes deep. Anyway, well, thank you for bearing with us today and joining with us. Yes. And I'm sure we're going to have a good time. I feel like, you know, it's the last one. At the end of the day, I think either one of us is expendable here <laughs> because it, I was thinking about this this morning. Like I could do a podcast without you called Redman and Riddle still. Mm-hmm. It would just be me talking about lots of riddles. <laughs> I could there's one in the Bible, you know, the story of Samson out of the eater, something to eat, out of the cool. strong, something sweet. I could do, you know, what's got four fingers of thumb but is neither flesh, bone, or skin or fowl. You never cease to amaze it's a, what's inside. Well, the answer's a glove. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know how interesting the podcast would be, but I could do it. And then you could do one. You could team up with a rap guy. You know, you get Redman and Riddle or like a well-known chewing tobacco brand. You could still do Redman and Riddle. The options are just So I feel like either one of us is expendable here. (laughs) Uh, But we're trying our best. The R&R, you know, we're we're the worst and least well-known of all the R&Rs. You've got... (laughs) Rest oh and relaxation. Goodness. Wow. You've got rock and roll. Wow. And Redmond and Riddle. Yeah, we don't so really. That's, that's, I think that's, if we do another series, that should be our motto. The worst. The, the, the lowest, uh, the least of the R&Rs. Yeah, the least of all our, <laughs> the R&Rs. That sounds very special. That would be the one. Anyway, uh, let's jump in today. Are we going to start today with a question from Kelly from Louisiana? Hey, guys. My name is Kelly. I'm a worship leader from Louisiana. And my question is a poser question. You guys have quoted poser many times. Y'all even joked about renaming the podcast, the Redmond Riddle and Poser podcast. So my question is, well, I, since I've been listening and hearing you guys talk about Tozer, I've never read any Tozer before. So I picked up my first Tozer book, The Pursuit of God, and I've been reading it and it has been blowing my mind. So I, I see now why you guys love Tozer so much. But my question is, what Tozer book should I read next or what other book recommendations do you have for worship leaders? Thank you guys so much. Well, Kelly, thanks for your question. Personally, I'm very encouraged by this that I've managed to convert someone to to Tozer. I didn't. Uh, I'm not sure I managed with Jeremy. <laughs> so, so it's nice to at least have one it's person. True. I do feel like this Tozer thing is a bit one sided. Yeah. There's pretty much one champion here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's a good, it's a great question, and I'm glad that you got into reading some of his stuff. All, with, as with all these people, we've all got our strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. But I, I do love that when Toza leans into this this subject of worship and some of these subjects about the presence of God yeah. or about how we carry on 
in the way we lead people towards God. I think he, he hits the nail on the head quite often. Yeah. And he's very quotable, and hopefully I've proved that. But I would say, <laughs> to answer your question, well, the first thing I would say, I listened back to your question, I realized you actually said the word Toza eight times, Kelly, which I think is maybe more than I've said, you know, <laughs> the whole thing. But So there you go. But there's actually a book called Toza on Worship and Entertainment. Yeah. And it's not it's not a book he wrote. It's a it's a collection of things that he said in sermons or different written pieces or things here and there. And they've put them all to get together. And if you can get hold of that one, that will give you a great like spiritual punch in the gut. It's yes. it's it's very intense because yeah. they've put all these quotes together. I, I don't know what you would say, Jeremy, if you have any thoughts on this. The the yeah. other ones for me would be the knowledge of the holy. Mm. Uh, and whatever happened to worship is a very good one too. Yeah, no, those are huge. I feel like, no, and I am a huge fan of Tozer. It's, it's not, <laughs> Matt's not carrying that solo. And I've also read The Pursuit of God, which likewise kind of changed my life. But I feel honestly challenged. This is just kind of tackling like a, maybe a broader, you know, topic on this is I feel particularly with a guy like Tozer or with any of these challenging authors, the, the, the thing that I find myself or I challenge myself is, is go, I don't want anything to fall short of just inspiration. I, I always want to find a way to move towards implementation, to move towards actual change. And I, I feel like we have a culture that we celebrate things that are like fire. Like, oh, that podcast or that book or that, you know, thing is fire. I think the real question, though, is what are we going to do with the fire? That's like, great. So if anything, I would more lean into instead of like, I mean, you can build your library. You can build your Tozer library. By all means, build your Tozer library. But I would more go if, if you're getting rocked by like the pursuit of God, what I would do is I would, I'd grab two other gals and just be like, hey, would you go through this with me? Maybe other worship leaders and, and then go, Lord, like how can this, how do we implement this? Like how are we supposed to take this and have it actually change the way that we approach you, change the way that we worship you? And, and see where that conversation grows. Because there's so much richness that we just leave untapped. You know, we leave it as inspiration. But the whole point of inspiration is to actually change us. That is you know? so good. Because so, yeah. that happens to me. You can get something, that's, oh, that's such a great quote. Like, amazing. And it hits you, but then it, it kind of leaves you. I love what you're saying. Yeah. So, yeah, so I mean that. Dive. Yeah, that's that's the thing that I would lean into is just how how I mean that is the forever challenge because yeah. for me I need inspiration. Like yeah. I thrive on inspiration, but I find if I can't find ways for inspiration to actually change or to move towards change, it doesn't really go anywhere and it doesn't keep the fire lit in my heart. So I think community is a huge piece of that. And sometimes I'm like, man, if you just took one of Tozer's quotes. <laughs> one of the quotes and, and just was like, okay, how am I supposed to lean into this? I think that is, it's, it's Lord, teach us what it means to steward the things that you've given us through That's these great. guys. You know, I thought I might have gone too far when a friend of mine, he's the worship <laughs> pastor at a Holy Trinity Brompton in London, a guy called Josh. He sent me a, okay. a thing saying, I think you should start a, a, like a merch line, um, oh, WWTD, no. what oh, would no. oh, Tozer no. do? Okay, oh, I, no. I thought I might have, I might have gone <laughs> overboard here. <laughs> He was being I, very cheeky. I hope you guys know this is like a glimpse into like a true wordsmith. The fact that Matt counted how many times Kelly said the word <laughs> Tozer just shows you what he's paying attention to and how yeah. his brain's working. Yeah. It's amazing. And if you run out of Tozer books and you have a deep dive and you, you there's always Jeremy Riddle's book, uh, sure. The Reset, <laughs> uh, available on all good booksellers. Uh, it, and I mess about, but it is it is. It almost carries a similar tone, honestly, mm. in, in, in some of the ways it illuminates mm. um, some of the areas we need to think about and play close, play, pay close attention to. So That's kind. you've got to do that. Uh, I didn't buy one. I got one for free. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, let's have another question. This is David from Englewood, Colorado. Hey, guys. David here from Englewood, Colorado, which is just south of Denver. Love to hear you guys talk a little bit about the place of excellence in worship and worship leading. Uh, we on our team think that excellence is important, uh, but sometimes it feels like it's a little too important. And if we're not careful, it, it can become our main goal, and it's not our main goal. Jesus, his name, his glory is our main goal. So we want to resist the temptation while also recognizing that excellence can be valuable and important uh, to eliminate distractions or provide some level of consistency. Uh, so I'd be grateful for any thoughts, stories, uh, insight you guys have on this topic. Thanks so much. 
Thank you, David. That's a great question. And it's, it's definitely one, obviously, we've spoken about a little bit on the podcast already, but I think there's, there's definitely more to say on this. Mm-hmm. I've always loved Psalm 33, verse 3, talks about play skillfully and shout for joy. And I, th- I think that's, there's one verse, it says, play skillfully and with a loud noise. Mm-hmm. And, and I kind of like this thing of like, you've got this raw explosion of, of praise, but also the skillful side, the, yeah. the trained side. And for me, I've never been in danger of leaning too far into excellence, <laughs> <laughs> personally. So I almost need a challenge on the other uh, side where sometimes I can get a little bit lazy. Yeah. Like I, I, was, I was songwriting with a guy called Tommy Walker recently who oh a lot of people would know and, he, and he's, you know, he's brought some good songs into the world and a wonderful worship leader. Mm-hmm. And it, it turned into a guitar lesson though because <laughs> we were, we were, he, he kept playing these chords. I had no clue what it was and I was like, how do you do that? And what's that called and this? And it, it, instead of a songwriting session, it became a guitar lesson. That's amazing. And it just highlighted the fact Okay, I think we have slightly different callings. Like he is a musician's yeah. musician. Yeah. And I'm never even if I give all my hours to it, I'm not gonna be Tommy Walker yes. as a guitarist. But it did highlight in me, oh, I think I'm a little bit lazy in this area. Yeah. And you know, there's other areas I'll pay more attention to, particularly the forming of words and the lyrical side of things. But that doesn't maybe excuse me being a little bit lazy or laid right. back. Right. at least right. uh, in that area. So this hit, this question hits me maybe differently to how it hmm. hit, hit other people. Sometimes it, it's a, I need to be called out in this area, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> That's so good. Yeah, I feel um, I definitely lean in the, in the, in the same direction. Like I, I'm not, I am, I'm basically a, a, a guitar hack. I, I survive. I survive our sets. Although I feel like I have learned to, I have worked at things like just even learning how to play with a click, learning how to not be something that, and again, my sound guys might, might, (laughs) might share a different story here on this, but I try and be something that's that not something that they have to navigate, (laughs) but something that they can actually kind of feature. I'm, I'm actually hopefully adding to the musical dynamic instead of just being like, let's, let's find a way to mitigate how terrible this is. But um, I do feel like people like us, particularly worship leaders, honestly, do need to be challenged a little bit more in the area of excellence. But the thing about it is, is what I want to encourage all church ministries to do is to identify your highest value, because excellence is not the highest value, you Mm -hmm. know, when it comes to to worship. And I, I, I touch on this a little bit in the book, and I just talk about how excellence is a value that's meant to be subservient to your higher values. Um, for instance, my, I, my highest value, if I were to rank values and you had following the Holy Spirit as a value and excellence as a value, well, obviously following the Holy Spirit is going to be a value that trumps excellence. Actually, and for me, what I say is actually following the Holy Spirit redefines what excellence actually means, yeah. which means that if my highest value is to follow the Holy Spirit, then excellence means that whatever I do— <laughs> Excellence means for me is how well am I equipped to follow the Holy Spirit, which means also I think it redefines what it means for a band too, because excellence, if you define excellence as executing a song flawlessly from start to finish, then that eliminates almost following the Holy Spirit. For me, it's more like excellence for a band for me. If I'm playing with a band and I want them to pursue excellence, it means that if I take a risk and I go after the Holy Spirit, then they have a skill set in place that enables them to go with me. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's a massive thing. And also, and again, that kind of excellence, you have to work at it. Like there's work involved to be able to actually follow the Holy Spirit and do it really, really well. Otherwise, it does become a train wreck and all that kind of a thing. Yeah. The thing that I want to agitate, though, is, is just going, sometimes I feel like excellence becomes this isolated thing that we serve. And, and it's like, well, we just have to do it excellently. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We have to define what excellence means for us. And I think that could be individual for every community, yeah. depending on what God's called them to champion and carry. And uh, yeah. Yeah, because you could see another stream or another church doing it and think, oh, we don't measure up to that. Right, exactly. But it, but it actually might be excellence for, for, for your own situation. Right. And, and, and then so the good. danger also would be to not compete with yourself in a way like sometimes i see the things like wow. oh every like easter or christmas we've got to outdo what we did last time <laughs> you know and, and and there's something good about stretching but there's sometimes there's an unhealthy side to it right of of, of really maybe it's some pride in the mix or you know mm. or some 
creative snobbery. I don't know. There's little mm. things that can seep in wow. and think like, oh, you, you've really lost it why we're doing it excellently. Right. We've right. really lost the, the idea. That's right. I mean, obviously for the glory of God, right. hopefully to make people feel at home and right. engaged and some really good reasons. But sometimes I feel like uh, we can definitely get into this creative pride thing yeah. where we, we're just trying to better ourselves, but we've really lost the point of why. Yeah. And I, I you know, honestly, that's really the tension is, is how do we do something really, really well? Because we don't honor God by doing something poorly. Yeah. <laughs> so how can we do something really, really well without losing the heart? Yes. And I find, you know, it's interesting because in a lot of environments that I've been in, I've realized that it's more the excellence piece that's, that, that starts to drive it and move it forward. And so I'm constantly being like, we got to get back to the heart. We got to get back to the heart. But I've had the privilege. It's been the insightful privilege of going to certain environments where excellence isn't championed at all. And it's like all heart. And man, one time I had to play with a team in that environment <laughs> and it was the roughest thing oh. I think I've ever done. I'm like, a few of those. We're, I'm like, we're, we're barely surviving. Like I'm doing yeah. everything in my power to overcome just to be able to get through a song. Yeah. And I, I, I go, oh man, if I had to come back to this church and actually minister a message, it, it would be like, hey guys, like this has to rise. <laughs> this has to come up. Be, you know, because that's part of our job. That's our privilege is to do something in such a way as to serve the people of God yeah. so that they can enter in without distraction and all the other things that we can kind of bring to the table. I'm and, usually the yeah. worst musician in every band that I've been it's and then humbling. so humbling now and again truth. when I get in a context where I'm one of the best um, like, it's oh. very humbly I think oh this is what it's like playing with me <laughs> <laughs> that's a great way to look at that but yeah. seriously I I went I showed up the other day and I remember looking at the guitarist's pedal board and he had like 12 pedals on there and I thought man, this guy takes it so seriously. Mm. I haven't thought about my guitar sound for like two, <laughs> two years. Yeah, two decades. And it probably shows. <laughs> yeah. And and it made me think, uh, no, this is, I mean, we've got slightly different calls and slightly true. different it's roles, true. but it doesn't excuse me from That's being right. like, oh, who cares? It's, these things can be important. It, it's 100% true. And I would honestly just, this is for worship leaders particularly, I would say, like, be excellent at your instrument. It's easy for us to rely on the band to carry us. And, and we, we can almost be lazy because, yeah. you know, it's like, well, my drummer's got it and, or this or that. Or we, 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 allow, we, we allow them to compensate for our lack. And, and I, I think I've been challenged more and more, particularly watching worship leaders who I see do, doing that. And for one, what you begin to witness is you watch the cap that it puts on them and you watch the cap that it puts on the band. And, and the small little falterings that we have during worship or the small little tempo things, what they do is they just kind of create an insecurity in the music itself. And that creates an insecurity in the people. And it's yeah. weird how that insecurity in us, those little musical insecurities, when we're really not comfortable on an instrument, they translate to a general sense of insecurity in the room. But yeah, when we so. are strong in our instruments, again, that's what we just want to release faith. And, and we, want to, we want to step into the fullness. Excellence really is just about releasing us to be fully who we were meant to be. Yeah. And, and that's where I know. When, when, I'm, when I'm not really thinking about the lyrics, when I'm not really thinking about what the band is doing, when, when, when they're so with me and, and I'm able to play so strongly and sing so strongly, which requires a lot of work on your voice too, that man, there's there's something that just gets released instead of held down. Yes, I and, love that, and that's what we're after. Wonderful. Okay, here's another question. This is Christine. Hey guys, my name is Christine Curry, and I'm from Ontario, Canada. I've really been enjoying listening to your podcast. I think it is very relevant for today, and I'm excited to listen to more. I'm wondering if you could get into a little bit more about character. I'm reading The Great Reset, which is so good and humbling. And I think that um, the purity of our hearts is extremely important. And so I was wondering how you keep your team accountable and yourself accountable in that way, because the worship that you lead, I mean, it has to come from a pure heart. Otherwise, it goes in so many other directions. So thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Christine, so much for your question. And the first thing I need to say is I loved how you called Jeremy's book The Great Reset, <laughs> which is a whole other book. Yes, entirely. Very much so. 
I was short as a slip of the tongue, but yeah. that gave me a lot of pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, why don't you have a go at this one? Um, no, I think that um, yeah, Matt has some things to say on this <laughs> too when it comes to character. Character really is the foundation of everything that yeah. we do. And at the end of, the, of our lives, to not have that in place is to really miss miss the mark entirely. And so obviously, yes, it matters. Purity really, really matters. Purity is also like so expansive. Like it's, it's, a, it's a massive topic. It's not just one thing. So I, I also think purity is largely an inside job. We can, you can create an atmosphere, you can create a culture around purity, but ultimately at the end of the day, this is something that we all kind of have to individually steward. And just that, you know, so all I can really share, I guess, is my own journey when it comes to stewarding this. And you have to give access to people who are really close to you to speak into those areas if you really want to know. And I would say even actually before doing that, one of the things that David did with the Lord is he said, search me and know me. Like he invited the Lord to actually search his motives and search his heart. And, and I, I, I have found that is a dangerous prayer to pray. It's the best prayer. It's a very needed prayer to pray. And what you realize, what I realize in this, in this, in this journey when it comes to purity is, is how many ways, how many narratives I have, uh, self-justifying kind of narratives mm. that I have in my own heart for what I'm doing. But really, when I ask the Lord to search me and he puts a finger on it, that area of like, no, that is self-promotion. You're just, you've created a narrative that, that kind of excuses that, but that actually is self-promotion. And once the Lord does that a couple of times, it, it, it's, it's kind of like it gives you a little bit more insight and discernment into your own heart. And again, particularly, I feel like in the day and age of social media, this is, this is where the Lord really had to do quite a work in my heart. And I had to almost create like a process before I posted anything or did anything I'm not even saying that this is, I mean, it's going to sound pretty extreme, but it's still very helpful for me in, in kind of walking this out of just going like, why am I posting this? Like, what yeah. are my real true motives behind doing this? And are they really pure? Because I, I want purity to be the message and thing that flows out of my life. And so, so therefore, I need to make sure that that wellspring in me really is pure and it's yeah. not being convoluted or diluted and so those were just helpful things and and uh, to kind of train me like to go like no 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 i only want to post what what i really feel the lord did purity for me guys is just obedience to what the lord is really calling you to do not not to try and build your own thing or do your own thing like i have no problem if i feel the lord has given me a message i am going to get on and i'm going to share that message and i'm going to go after it but there's a fine line between that and and all the other other things if the lord gives you a song and, and you know your call to release it, then it is actually obedience to get out and go after it and release that song. But again, we walk a fine line with that. But if you invite the Lord to search your heart, he is, he is the Holy Spirit is a very effective at doing that. It's one of, the, one of the beautiful roles that he plays in our lives. And then honestly, it's, I open up the door to my spouse, even my kids, whew, that's so humbling. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> your kids can see things in, yeah, in, 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 you know, in your life and in your, you know, in your habits. Uh, that if you really, so anyway, I, I've really opened the door to people to speak into that. And I think if you can create conversation within your community, not to judge, like judgment goes nowhere, yeah. but to say, hey, this is something we really want to go after. And 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 so if we can create some conversation about this, if we can challenge each other. You know, in this, it's a really, really beautiful thing. Yeah, absolutely. And that word accountability is a big one. Yeah. I think you do have some built-in accountability, like you say, with your wife or kids. Right. Because right. they see you on and off the stage and That's they see huge. all, they see the big picture, the whole thing. Yes. And even I got caught out getting defensive about something, even yesterday. Hmm. I was about to hmm. lead worship <laughs> and I had a text from my wife saying, hey, you I think you've taken my car key or, or do you know where my car key is? And I was the last person to drive her car. And I, and I was literally 10 minutes before I left worship. I, I think I went into like defensive mode. It's not me. And then, I, and then they found it in the car. I left oh. it in the car overnight. Oh, and, and it turns out it was me. It and it was, was a good me. moment to be like, okay, <laughs> be humble here. Be you, humble. you messed up. Yeah. Don't try and self-justify. Yes. Don't try, you know, and, and especially in the light of I'm about to walk onto a stage Wow. Where a lot of people are going to yeah. see the best part of you. Right. And they're going to see you doing what you do best. Right. They're not going to see the flaws and right. the 
feelings. It's really important, isn't it, to be it's huge. be willing to be called out. I've been on a few men's retreats the last couple of years, and mm. that's kind of a big step, honestly, because you go on these things knowing you can't go into that with, with the walls up. Yeah. You're going to get asked hard questions. You're going to get asked to be vulnerable. Right. And honestly, it's been so life-giving hmm. just because everyone's in it together. Yeah. And it's a chance to just give, be, yeah. be so far away from the stage or anything right. prominent or in front of people. And, and just to be, I'm just Matt. Yeah. You know, the, I'm not here as Matt Redman, a right. worship leader. I'm right. here as just Matt and taking the walls down. Hmm. And heard a lot of great leadership talks on this kind of thing. Huh. But one of them that really hit me, the guy said, leadership requires moral authority. Wow. And every time you compromise character, you compromise leadership. Even, so even with the little things. Wow. Even the little things. You're actually compromising right. the authority of, the, of your leadership. And every time there's compromise, it's going to hurt the cause. Yeah. And we've all seen that. We've all wow. seen probably the most disappointing things and the most disillusioning things. There's nothing more disillusioning that you see someone you looked up to That's and they're right. carrying the leadership baton. Right. Maybe it's just in your local church or maybe it's further afield and, they, and then they mess up yeah. and then it does hurt the cause yeah. and it, and it does dilute the power of what was happening through That's that right. ministry. But on the flip side, we've, we've also seen people who, who've done it the other way, people who've mm. run a long race mm. and they've managed to stay submitted yes. to Christ and have their character submitted to him. I mean, obviously watching Billy Graham's funeral a while back was a, was a big one where you Huge. saw this guy who'd, stayed very committed to yes. making sure that his lifestyle didn't undermine or compromise in wow. any way the authority that wow. he was carrying in, wow. in leadership. I had a friend, Louis Palau, who I became a Christian mm -hmm. through, and he passed away so recently, beautiful. went to be with Jesus, and I got to be there and sing at the memorial service. Wow. And again, it was just a great moment thinking, here's this guy in his mid-80s, hmm. loving his family, hmm. and he's got his flaws and his failings, but he's mm -hmm. doing all he can to stay on track Wow. And to carry what God's put in his hands well. And it's just a wonderful joy to be able to celebrate what God had done through him and the way that he'd kept strong and focused even to the end. And, yes. and for everyone in that room, it was a very inspiring moment. Yeah. Yeah, huge. I mean, and I just love so much about what you pulled out, particularly the small things. Like for me, I've just realized that the small things really, really matter. And if yeah. I am faithful to deal with the small things, not just in like a small ministry opportunities or that kind of thing, but small character flaws, if I go after those, then they lead to greater stewardship of, of, of uh, you know, other areas. There's something about being disciplined in those areas that actually really wins the battle before you're in any major battle. Yeah. And so I great. just want to encourage people with that too. And just to end on this one, before we get into our next question, there's a great quote, Archbishop William Temple, he said, worship is the quickening of conscience by God's holiness, mm -hmm. the nourishment of mind with his truth, the purifying of imagination by his beauty, the opening of the heart to his love, the surrender of the will to his purpose, mm -hmm. and all of this gathered up in adoration. Mm -hmm. And I've always been very drawn to that quote, but I, but I love how it involves the quickening of the conscience yes. and the surrender of the will and the purifying of the imagination, that true worship Pure worship's always going to involve some kind of change in us. And I love that. Yeah, Thank yeah. you so much, Christine, for your question. So our next question comes from Brad, also from Ontario, from Paris, Ontario, mm -hmm. in Canada, which I looked it up. It's apparently the prettiest little town in Canada. <laughs> so there you go. It's a little uh, ah, shout amazing. out to Brad. He, here's his question. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Brad. I'm from Paris, Ontario. I just want to thank you guys for, for doing this podcast. It's been really great. Anyway, I, I'd really love to hear about your songwriting process how, and maybe how that's changed over the years. Which one of your songs is it? Have you like maybe in like one sitting came together? And maybe I'd love to hear about one of your songs that maybe took took time and labor and that you put into it. Yeah. Anyway, thank you guys. I, I, again, I, I really have been blessed by the, these these episodes. So God bless you guys. Brad, thanks so much for your question. I always loved songwriting questions mm -hmm. and love talking about this. For me, the, the, the change really has been with the co-writing side of things. I think the first decade I did this pretty much was shut away in a room on my own. 
And there were some lovely elements to that. And I still like to do that now and again. And even with that, it wasn't totally on my own. I mean, you would open the door and invite people's insights into your songs. I wasn't proactively going after the co-writing side of things. And Hmm. what I realized as time went on is I think my strongest suit here is lyrically. Hmm. And I think when I'm around other people who are so melodically gifted, Mm -hmm. it, it shines that a light on that even more. And it makes me realize, oh, I think I could really lean into their gift. And, and so when I, when I co-write, it tends to be with people who have a lot of melodic ideas. Yeah. But then I also love people who've got strong lyrical ideas. You get to really flesh that out together and yeah. together wrestle something down. But the thing I would say about the co-writing process is, firstly, most things in the, in, most things in the kingdom of God are designed to be done in a community. Yeah. And there's a lovely community aspect of being in a room with someone and just sharing a day with them. And you get talking about all sorts of things and you get to have a Bible study together, mm-hmm. basically, as you write this song. Mm-hmm. You get to bring the best out of each other, lean mm-hmm. into each other's gifts. I mean, I love everything about that. Mm-hmm. So for me, that's been the biggest change. And then in terms of a couple of examples of songs, for me, the two best examples would be Blessed Be Your Name, which took months of rewriting and writing and trying to figure out even what kind of feel the song should right. have. Because because when we started writing, it was an up-tempo song and it just felt too jolly <laughs> for the theme. <laughs> you know, it was kind of fun to to sing, but the yeah. the lyrics didn't have the same resonance that we were hoping them to. Right. Then, so I turned it into like a real slow thing and then it didn't have any guts. Right. It felt like, okay, this is kind of pretty and, you know, kind of hits you but doesn't really have the guts and right. so it became like this mid-tempo kind of hopefully a little anthemic feel thing and but that was one wrestled with a lot and i wrestled with a lot of things in the song for example whether to have the bridge or not you give and take away you give and take away it felt like a strong thing to say that i felt like not everyone's gonna feel at ease with yeah. but because it was straight out of scripture and because i felt like i've lived it we decided let's put it in there. Yeah. And and at the end of the day, I think sometimes it's good to have some lyrics that are hard to sing. Yeah. I don't think you can sing that lyric unless you really believe in the sovereignty of God and right. believe in his father's heart wow. over your life. So that would be the one we wrestle with. Um, and then the one that came quickly, honestly, 10,000 reasons. One mm. third in the morning, uh, myself and my friend Jonas, just about to pack up, been mm. songwriting all day. He says, I've got this little melodic idea. Mm. He plays me it. And the whole thing just exploded into wow. life. It was like, oh, that's that bless the Lord thing we've been trying to write. Wow. And then I don't even know where the verses came from, but oh, they wow. just came out. And we did a few things afterwards, but a lot of that song happened in an hour. That's crazy. And it was to the point where it didn't have a pre-chorus. It didn't have a bridge. It took an hour to write. I'm thinking it's not finished. There's no way <laughs> we're putting that on the record. <laughs> and we nearly didn't. So, oh um, gosh. so there's a couple of uh, thoughts and insights from me, but how about you, Jeremy? That's so good. Yeah, I think songwriting's gone through like different seasons for me. There were, there were, I think there was a day where I wrote like two or three pretty significant songs, like, and they, there was just a season where it was, I was super prolific and, and I would finish a song journey in a day, but that, that day seems to be decades behind me. <laughs> I feel like. Uh, now the journey in songs is more, um, and maybe this is just time and capacity and all that kind of a thing, um, because um, songwriting, I'm, I'm actually actively trying to make it more of something that I that I steward in this season yeah. because I, I've historically neglected that. But now it's just, it's, it's really, one thing that I do really well is I catalog inspiration. So anytime I'm inspired, I've yeah. learned to just capture that whenever. A lot of times sound check is just a weird little <laughs> time and I'll just pop out ideas. I'll get inspired. I don't know how many different songs I've written out of ideas that came in sound check, but it's more, it's more revisiting those capturing in a moment of inspiration. Particularly, it's like, it's like when you, when you go to turn on a tap and water is flowing, you know, after a while, 
you you begin to recognize that that's not that's not normal. That's that special. And so I never try and curate a season where things are just flowing. Not for my own self individually. I'll, I'll wait till I'm like, okay, I'm I don't have anything flowing right now, and then I'll start to revisit moments of inspiration, and I find that that kick starts something. So a lot of my songs are coming together over time, like through time. The other thing I, I just want to say, because I fully believe everything that Matt said, co-writing is this beautiful thing that the church has discovered. And I think it's it's really powerful. And I also found a, like a sweet spot in it with lyric writing. I found like, oh, that was a real strength of mine. Because when you start off as yeah. a songwriter, you kind of think you're awesome at everything. <laughs> and, then, and then later on, you're like, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually yeah. not. And I realized that that I had a much greater strength lyrically than I did melodically. And so when I would write with people like Brian Johnson, who 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 is just an incredible melodic writer and lyric writer, but he would say probably his strength, you know, historically has been melody and and so it was like, oh, that our strengths would come together and man, it would it was it was so powerful some of yeah. the tunes that would result in that. And I also believe that if a song is going to be taken up and sung by a community, that communal process is actually pretty vital. It's pretty important. That's really good. No thought of that. I, I also think that something you said, maybe this is this is alluding to it. I, I almost paused it. I don't know if you're quoting somebody else, but I said if a song was gonna end up in worship, it needs to begin in worship. And I, I do I do love that. And I do think that's one of the dangers of co writing. Yeah. You know, is 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 because what what you can write in a in a worshipful atmosphere. But I do, I think there was a season in my life where I realized that I had lost something as, as a writer and I had become an amazing co-writer and I had become highly skilled as a co-writer and, yeah. and, and I was helping everybody else finish their song, but there was something in my heart that I had neglected. Yeah. And when it came down to it, I'm like, what, how, do I still know how to sing my own song to the Lord? Do, do I know just how to worship him in song form? Because songwriting didn't begin for me like in this thing of like, I want to write massive anthems for the church and I want to, you know, I want to get around all the ringers and people know how to do this and carry that skill set. It, it really just began with, I, I, ha, I, I want to find language for my heart. I, yes. I, I, like, and music became the thing that initially it was just like, this, this is where I can take my heart. And, and, I, and I felt like that was one of the things I'd lost and all the co-writing and all that kind of a thing. And so I went on this journey, still am on that journey of like, Lord, I want to recapture my heart for you, you know, like David, David was always just out there initially songwriting. I'm sure that oh, Asaph and He-Man and all these other guys eventually became brilliant, colla- you know, collaborators on stuff. But, but originally it was like that, that thing that was forged in David. Yeah. And I would say to a lot of songwriters initially, make sure that thing has been forged. Make sure you, you've gone through a season where it's just you on the hills and you, you've learned to pour out your heart to the Lord. Because only then will you be able to really bring something of real worth to a, to a songwriting gathering. Only then that, that, those, that, that posture, that heart of worship that was forged in you. Because otherwise, I just honestly don't think that the Lord has moved by songs that are just like, oh, that's a cool idea, and you got yes. a cool idea, and I got a cool lyric. If we put all our cool lyrics together, we've got a winner. I don't think that that's, that's ultimately what becomes like true incense or fragrance. Now, if it springs from a heart singing it to the Lord, again, that, of course, that is fragrance, but, but I want the Lord to be honored in the process as yeah. well. And so I think, I totally agree. you know, that's just There's some that thoughts thing where that. you can get into that, yeah, you just this clever creativity right. or like you know how to, oh, Right. This could be a cool idea or, exactly. or this could be the seed of a song. This has a fresh spin on it. And you've lost that little David the shepherd boy yeah. out there in the field yeah. just singing his heart out for the sake of it. And I, I so agree with you on yeah. that. And that's really good. So I think it's both end. You know, yeah. you got to steward both end. And I, I think, man, it's like if you're, if you're struggling to go like, when's the last time I just sang to the Lord? Like worship the Lord. Man, that's something to relight a fire in. Yeah. And, our next question is from David Anderson. He's from Ireland, but now lives in Louisiana. Hey, Matt and Jeremy. My name is David Anderson. I'm actually originally from Ireland, uh, but I'm currently a youth pastor in Louisiana and America. In fact, Matt, I had the opportunity to be coached by you in worship for a year at the Message Trust in Manchester. And uh, really, that, that was a transformational year for me as a worship leader. Um, but I'm somewhat like Jeremy now in that I'm a youth pastor uh, with the, still with the heart of a worshiper, but uh, a lot of what I do now is walking with young worship leaders, young people, and kind of guiding them on, on this journey of authenticity. I wonder if both of you could give some key tips on how to do this. I know for me personally, it was more of a, a personal journey with the Lord, 
as I worshipped and got to know him. Uh, but now as I walk with these young people uh, and they desire this, uh, how can I continue to coach them, lead them and encourage them in being a worshipper in both spirit and truth? Thanks so much. David, it's great to hear from you. Haven't seen you for a few years. The first thing I have to say is we're all jealous of your accent. <laughs> Very cool, that Irish accent. Although I have to say the the kind of robot thing that transcribes these questions that come in, he was having <laughs> severe problems with you. He didn't have a clue what you're talking about. Yeah, that's amazing. But it's all right. I've gone through and I've, I've, I've worked it out. From Ireland to Louisiana, that is quite a transition. That's a transition. And a lot of good things have come out of Ireland. Let's go. Got Ren Collective. Wow. Catherine Scott, Keith Getty. Let's go. I mean, the list is endless. Bono, we include him, I don't know. (laughs) So anyway, thank you so much, David, for your question. And uh, in a minute, I'm going to defer to the former youth pastor, Jeremy Riddle, on this one. But I would say I do love that dynamic that happens when you're discipling someone and and they're in the worship team. There's something about that. keeps them drawn in it keeps the lines of communication open it means you you get to give them responsibility and get to see them run with stuff and for me i say that because that was my testimony a big part of me getting disciples was becoming involved in the worship team and it just meant there was this constant lines of communication open Hmm. it meant that i had this kind of leadership thing to run with i don't know it was just a really important part for me so i love i love when you get to do those things together uh, you get to disciple youth, yeah, and there's a worship team di- yeah, di- so component good. to it. Right. And I love the word authenticity, by the way. Yeah. That that that's a key word that you said there. But yes. over to the yeah. former expert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, expert. I, I did. I, I was. I had the joy, honestly, the privilege that I didn't know that I needed. I didn't even know the privilege that it was when I got my first. It was my first ministry assignment. Was pastoring junior high. And I pastored middle school students, sixth through eighth grade for about six years. And uh, such a marking time. I tell you what, I've also had the privilege of coming back to the church where I, I pastored youth about 12 years later. And man, I tell you what, there is nothing more encouraging for any youth minister out there than to watch what happens a decade later. Like the guy, the young guy that I taught his first drum beat to, he's gone on, he's be, become a remarkable drummer. The, the kid that I tried to teach guitar in to. In spite of you teaching. <laughs> in spite of me teaching. But the kid I, 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 I like uh, taught, uh, he, he could keep time to save his life. But I just, <laughs> I just like, well, I'll just kind of keep teaching him chords. He's become a phenomenal worship leader, worship pastor, songwriter. It, it is amazing what God does in that season. So, David, first of all, I just, it's so funny. I just hear your heart. So clearly, and oh, the Lord is just so pleased with the posture, with the assignment that you've you've taken up, and and it's a, it's a really noble thing. And so I'm just going to share a bit of my journey because ultimately this is really establishing a worship culture in youth, like something that's alive and vibrant inside their hearts, also alive and vibrant in their community. And I, I think these are huge things. I always think if you want to impact the macro culture, if you want to create a, a culture that's pervasive, you have to start with something potent. And, and micro cultures influence um, the macro. And I, I feel like for me, I was just like, okay, Lord, wh- what, what, can I, what, can I, what can I do to kind of ignite this culture? Because if you know anything about junior high kids, it's not like you walk into a, ju- a group of junior hires. It's like this thriving worship community. It is, it, is, it is, you know, many times very challenging to even lead that group of people in worship. You wonder if anything's happening at all. So I decided I would grab whoever would be interested in music. Music was kind of the hook. And I'm like, if you want to learn guitar, and you want to learn how to worship, I was going to start a little discipleship group. And I did. I started with any, any of the young kids, whether they had a full-blown heart for the Lord or not. But I just, I, I just said, hey, if you want to learn guitar, so I just teach worship. And the other thing I did, because I was just looking for <laughs> curriculum that didn't require a lot of maintenance or a lot of effort on my part, and I just I, I assigned them three psalms a week. And I said, hey, your job is to read three psalms a week and come back with three things that you've learned about worship and you've learned about the heart of God. That's cool. And I tell you what, between teaching those guys just simple songs and teaching them about the basic principles of worship, just working through three psalms a week was probably one of the most transformational things. Honestly, those guys have all kind of gone on. Something was sown into their hearts. Uh, so don't ever despise those small beginnings, David. Don't, don't despair if it doesn't seem to be really taking fruit. So much more is happening than, than you're able to see. The other thing is, is there's something about youth leading youth. 
There's just something that happens when, when, when I begin to, it was my, my mission to raise up one full, complete youth worship team and to have them lead it completely. And I tell you what, when they began to do that, and, and we also made space for, for any of the youth to be like, hey, if you want to worship the Lord, come forward. I just knew that if we could get like a small percentage of those people, again, more is caught than taught. And that's yeah. just true when it comes to worship. And so if we could get four youth in that room, you know, just going after the Lord, lifting their hands, lifting their voices, that thing was, 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 was going to affect change in the group. And man, that really began to happen when youth began to lead youth. So anyway, just bless you. Take whatever you can from that. But this is such a, it's a fun assignment. Let the Lord lead you. Let the Lord guide you in it. And uh, just know that there's going to be incredible fruit in the decades to come. Great words. Love that. Right. Let's have one final question. This is Drew from Nebraska. Hi, Matt. Hi, Jeremy. This is Drew. We are calling from Kearney, Nebraska. My question is this. As a worship leader or worship pastor, what is one simple thing that you can do that would help prevent burnout in ministry? Love your podcast. Blessings. Thank you, Drew. This is an important question. Hmm. Very, very good. That age old classic of is the pace at which I'm doing the work of God, destroying God's work in me. Huh. And I, I've i definitely had those seasons, hmm. seasons where you think, yeah, I'm doing some good stuff here, but I'm not sure that I'm growing. Yeah. And actually, I'm not feeling super alive on the inside. Right. Often it comes down to making sure that your output doesn't exceed your input. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is hmm. just a simple equation sometimes. For me, I, I find out, okay, this is because I'm doing this and doing this and doing this, and I'm not actually drinking from anywhere. You know, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not finding ways of input. So I, I talked about this men's retreats. It's been a wonderful way of me. I don't have to do anything on those, and I just step out, and the, I'm there for a few days, and it's just input, and it's hmm. just a chance to reassess hmm. where you're at and have find special time with God and usually someone recommends a book and you end up, he just, you know, it opens up a, a whole other thing. So I would say that would be the thing. I think sometimes the temptation can be in these moments. So I'm just going to stop and I'm going to call pull back. And I've had quite a few people on teams I've led saying, oh, I'm going to take a time out yeah. and I'm going to withdraw from, from with ministry. S- sometimes I don't know if that's the best yeah. approach. That's it, real. it can be sometimes, but mm-hmm. honestly, to stay involved in ministering and, and stay involved in a team, sometimes the very best thing for you. You know, you may not be feeling it as much as you want to, but um, for me, the environment of being in a worship team and and of having to keep walking in faith in that way is actually yeah. pretty good for me. Yes. You know, I'm, I'm not saying it's not a hard and fast rule. Right. But I'm saying for me, the first, if, if I'm in a period of dryness or you, or you say, yeah. feel like, oh, I might be starting to get burnt out. Yeah. I don't know if, for me, that's not always the first thing of like, I'm just going to remove everything from no. my life because some of those environments actually healthy. <laughs> yes. but, uh, but I've been feeling honestly recently, like I haven't been reading enough books. Huh. Like I, I, And it's because of carrying a lot yeah. and we've had a lot going on in life. But I think, no, I really got to take time out soon. Yeah. Find some things that really interest me, inspire me and get yes. my head down because I know how much I come alive. Yes. When I find a book that, I find illuminating and spiritually exciting in some way. Yes. It's so good for me. It's, it's like water to my soul. Right. Um, and think of the old Henri Nouwen quote, and I think I might have quoted him uh, on one of the early podcasts, but he talks of a time where he, he, he's referring to the older son in the, in the prodigal son story. He says, I'd been working so hard on my father's farm hmm. that I'd forgotten the joy of being at home. Wow. And, and I definitely resonate with wow. that. Yeah, that just to try and keep in that joy, keep experiencing and knowing that joy of like, yeah, I'm working hard here, but I know the joy of being at home and That's being so with my good. father. That's so good. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with Matt, um, particularly in that sense that taking yourself out of the game is actually, it seems like a quick fix. But uh, speaking from experience, the times that I've done that, and I've only done it probably a couple of times, I don't think I ever got much healthier. <laughs> I don't think I got any more vibrant for, for, for the time away because that wasn't actually the real issue. And, and I think sometimes um, uh, this journey is, is a little bit more complex. 
because everything has an impact on our hearts. And a lot of times what, what, what is, feels like tiredness or weariness is actually connected to a different struggle or a different issue. And if you don't actually go after the root issues or if you're not able to um, kind of work on those and shore those up, it does lead to kind of this perpetual kind of fatigue, you know, in ministry. And so this journey really requires wisdom. Um, there's some brilliant coaches, brilliant books out there. It is so important for leaders to be readers and to go after so many resources available on this topic that can kind of help bring insight. I think I've just learned to monitor, be a little bit more self-aware. I definitely, that has not been my strong suit. I've kind of plow through, kind of ignore whatever's going in my heart, just get the job done kind of a thing. And I think I've, I've learned to be much more self-aware. And the things that I'm, I'm, I am... Someone, someone described the difference with burnout is like, well, he's like, there's running out of gas and then there's running out of oil. And he's like, those oh, are two yeah. very different things. If you run out of gas, it's a pretty quick fix. Yeah. But if you run yourself to the point where you run out of oil, that's a much longer recovery period. I can testify to this. <laughs> my very first car <laughs> was a Nissan Micra and I run out of oil. And, in yeah. my, and, and the reason that I destroyed that car, it was a write-off. Yes. Was because I thought running out of oil was the same as running out of <laughs> gas or petrol, as we would oh, say. Look at that. So I just like, oh, the light's on. It's yeah. cool. I'll figure it out at some it's point. It's not that big of a deal. And if it runs out, I'll just pour it more in. Right. And so That's I can testify that. that he wow. was correct. <laughs> Ah, look at that. And that, that's a great analogy. No, it really I love is. that. It really is because... Unpack I, that a little bit more. Yeah. Well, because I, I feel like for me, it's been like... Y- yeah. If you violate that, we, we, we can run out of gas on a, a pretty regular basis and you can run on fumes for, 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 you know, you know, a while. But if you get to the point where you run out of oil, you just realize like, oh, this is more like a three to six month kind of recovery time. Yeah. And, and, and as we, if you run out of gas, if you're like, oh, I'm out of gas, I need a little rest. I need a little recharge. I need some more intimacy, you know, with the Lord, whatever it is. Like, and all of a sudden you spend two hours reading a Tozer book and you're like, I'm good. Like I it does it tank. for me every time. Yeah. <laughs> I knew it. Uh, but it's true. It's, it's, you're like, oh, actually, I'm not actually burned out. I, I just needed a little bit more gas. And so I'm keeping gas in the tank is, is huge. I also learned to just monitor certain things in my heart. Like you got to monitor callousness. And when there's a lack of tenderness, when, when, when I am struggling to find compassion <laughs> for people, I, I start to just like, oh, these are warning signs yeah. that something has to shift in me. So rest, connection, uh, maybe greater discipline, maybe it's these other things that I need to shore up. So anyway, I, I, I think this is such a comprehensive yes. thing. There's so many aspects to this. It's impossible to address them all. But being a little bit more self-aware, kind of going and, and just looking, okay, what's missing? And again, guys, always, always, always invite the Holy Spirit into these conversations. He has wisdom for you. He will lead you to those pastors. This isn't meant to just be pure psalmist poetry. Like, like you know, Psalm you know, uh, 20, 23 is like, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not like. He leads me beside still waters. The Lord will lead you in these things. And I, I've just learned as a discipline, uh, and this has come from years of just trying to figure something out on my own. I've just learned the discipline of going, Lord, lead me. Like, reveal what's going on to me like open up my eyes and and god will do that and and he will do that personally sometimes he'll speak to you he'll do it in scripture he'll also do it in relationship yeah and and he'll have people that that really help you with this yeah keep gas in the tank move towards inspiration all that stuff matt you can speak a little bit more to that love that hudson taylor he was a missionary to china beautiful thing he said god's work done in god's way will never lack God's supply. Wow. And I, I, I love, love that. that. God's Huge. work done in God's way God's will way never key. lack God's hmm. supply. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's our prayer today. As we, as we end this podcast, I think we're trusting and knowing God's going to be enough for you wherever you are and for your team. And really hope that these conversations have been a help. Hmm. And we would love to keep hearing from you. You can feel free to leave a few more voicemails of if, if there's anything else stirring you up that you want to add. But for now, we're signing out. Yes. And um, Jeremy, why don't you pray over everyone? Yeah. Over everyone. Jesus, what a privilege it is to know you. Um, we do consider everything else to be rubbish in light of knowing you and making you known. That's the joy. That's the cry of our hearts as a bunch of worshipers and people that literally just burn to make you known, to make your salvation the beautiful saving work of your atonement known to to the world and to glorify you to raise up your name 
here on the earth, Lord. So I just bless. We just we just bless first and foremost the way that your spirit has been leading these people that have been tuning in. Holy Spirit, lead them. I just pray that there would be a uh, there would be uh, this would be a catalyst somehow yeah. for something dynamic to begin to happen between the spirit and the bride, like between us and and you, God, Lord. I just pray that you would lead your church, that you would ignite your church, that you would teach your church what it means to walk this stuff out. And I do. I pray that this wouldn't just be another insp- you know inspirational talk, but Lord, that that it would find a track that it would find a place to, to, to run on and, and that we would see something of great purity and great power beginning to emerge in this generation as we set our hearts and our minds to serve you wholeheartedly. Lord, I just pray that you would deal. You would deal ruthlessly. You would deal relentlessly with any compromise that's keeping us from your best, that's keeping us from the things, the way that we're, we're, we're supposed to glorify you, that's keeping the songs that you have yeah. uh, hidden in our, in our hearts from, from exploding out. Lord, I just pray that you would have your way in our lives, that you would establish Jesus, that you would stand up in us and you would move through us as we set our hearts on all the things that are above, Lord, that you would build your church and that you would build your church and that you would establish your government through your worshiping community. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. That's wonderful. Love that. God bless everyone. And we hope to see you another time.